What's up, everybody? I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour, and we are fixing to go do one of my favorite things that we get to do together on this channel. Sorry, I'm bumping things. And that is visit a church that's representative of a tradition that's different from my own. So for those of you who we haven't met yet, I am a Protestant. I am Reformed-ish and Evangelical-ish, and I've typically gone to churches that are built with economics in mind and are built with function in mind more than churches that tend to be more grand and impressive and loaded with theological art and theological meaning. So I get pretty excited when I go to churches from other traditions that aren't built with the same economic concerns and that are built with grander theological concerns and all of the accoutrements and details. I found that in Catholic churches. I found that in higher, fancier Protestant churches, and I've found that in the Orthodox Church, which is where we're going to go this time around. We're headed to Salt Lake City, Utah, to Saints Peter and Paul Orthodox Church, where we're going to meet Father Paul Trubenbach and get a sense of a specific brand of Orthodoxy called Antiochian Orthodoxy, like Antioch in Syria, where the Christians were first called Christians, according to the Bible. So I showed up there. I got a look at the outside. The most distinguishing marks that caught my attention here were the, the domes, the architecture that always gives away a church building as being Orthodox in one form or another. And these cool crosses up here that have a little different design. I picked his brain a bit about that. Then we went inside and there's this cool entryway that I figured we'd just rush right through and get to the nave, which is what people like me typically call a sanctuary. But there's a bunch of art and icons and stuff packed with meaning, even in the lobby. And then we entered into this narthex and it smells like incense and the sound is different and the busy downtown Salt Lake stuff just sort of fades away. And Father Paul explained that all of that is very intentional to reorient your senses away from what was going on outside to get your brain ready to go inside to this place of communal worship. And then from there, we walked into this glorious, remarkable space that is where most of their worship happens. And we're going to pick it up right there. This is beautiful. It's amazing. There's no seating. You right. just stand up the whole time? We do, yeah. Uh, Orthodox services, we stand almost the entire time. Every now and then we'll kneel. In the scriptures, almost every single case of somebody praying, they're praying in a position of standing. Standing is the, is the position of worship and of prayer. I've been to a couple of other Orthodox churches mm -hmm. that had pews like I would see in churches I attend. Mm -hmm. Is there like a pew controversy? Is there a pew crowd and a non-pew crowd? You can definitely find people who have a preference of one over the other. Okay. Um, however, however, um, even as pews have become more common, especially in America, because that's just kind of what people expect, but even in some of the countries like Greece, you'll find a lot of chairs and, and seating. Um, it does create some issues along with the worship. For instance, uh, during Great and Holy Lent, we do a lot of prostrations, which is bowing all the way down to the ground with your forehead to the ground. You can't really do that with pews. You can't really bow down unless you're ready to whack your head. I, mean, I did and that so, some when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> the sermon went long. Yeah, like, exactly. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So for the aesthetic nature of, of our worship, the fact that you know we're here trying to decrease ourselves, decrease our egoism, so there's room for Christ within our hearts. Our hearts are so filled with ourselves. We need we want to fill them with Christ. And so one of the ways we do that is we kind of embrace the discomfort of worship, and we're here to just deny ourselves and focus all on God. And part of that is you'll stand through maybe three, four hours of services standing. Your legs, wow. your legs hurt, your back aches, but your heart rejoices. Yeah, for us, I think the, the seating conversation is, is just an entirely practical one. Mm -hmm. What's gonna make this work the best for people? What's gonna get them in a situation where they're comfortable and receptive? But I suppose even that has meaning. I mean, that sends a cue to people who attend church as to what we are hoping the experience is like. Right. And so, I'm not surprised, based on how everything else here has looked, that you have a theological rationale for right. coming at it that way. And along with that, there's also this sense of freedom within worship. And that's one of the interesting things about the Orthodox Church is from the outside, a lot of people see a lot of canons and rules and dogmas and history, and they think it's all very constrictive. But the reality is that this should help us bring out our true selves, and there should be freedom within that. Freedom not only from sin, but freedom to unite with God. And so you'll notice during the services that there's a lot of walking around. People may just feel the need to go light another candle or go venerate an icon, or they see, they see family members or godparents, and the kids may want to go over and give them a hug. What is that balance that you're going for between order and chaos? This is, this is our job as clergy, is that we need to make sure that within that freedom, we also maintain the purpose 
of why we're here. We're here to worship God. And that means that whatever we're doing can't be a distraction to others. We have to make sure that our kids are learning how to pray in an environment like this, which is why we really emphasize family prayer, morning and evening. Get your kids used to standing in front of their icons and not having to move around and play and make a bunch of noise. And so there is a balance to be had there. Of course, there, we, we need to make sure that the worship is not being distracted from with people moving around. However, we also want to make sure that people don't feel so restricted that that uh, there's only one thing that you can and should be doing at every single moment, but rather you want to be able to express yourself in, in, in the, the appropriate ways in worship. What would it be like for somebody like me to show up? and like, We have visitors know, almost every single Sunday, and I always tell them, just make yourself at home. You can observe what other people are doing. If you want to do that too, you can. If you don't want to, you can take a seat, be relaxed, don't worry about it. No one cares. No one's here to watch you. They're here to worship God. And if they're, they're here watching you more than they're worshiping God, then they have a bigger problem than whatever you're doing. So you're mentioning that people might go and venerate an icon mm -hmm. in the flow of worship. Right. And I assume that's what we're looking at here up front. That's what these are. As you come in. So I see these, and to me, I don't mean to be offensive. I hope I'm not being offensive. They look like, like paintings, like mm -hmm. art. But I get the impression that the paintings at my church that depict people from church history, people from the Bible, mostly people from the Bible and mm -hmm. Protestant church, that that means something different than what an icon means. What's the difference between the two? Right. Well, with just a typical painting like you're talking about, what's the purpose behind it? Depict. It, it's to depict somebody and to beautify the area. With an icon, there's, there's much greater purpose because something actually is happening with this icon. At least that's, that's the theology of the church, that there's, there's some meaning being portrayed here. And so, you know, ink on, on a page doesn't necessarily make a book. It has to come up in some certain form. And then, you know, a, any book that you write, just because the scripture is also ink on a page doesn't mean it's the same thing. There's grace that comes out through reading the scriptures. And so with this, it's the same idea. Just as the scriptures are the written word of God, we would see this as kind of the painted word of God. And there's a theological reality and there's something more importantly happening with this veneration. So what what's happens? happening is this, is when we, take, uh, when we take a figure that's depicted, in this case, this is St. Paisios of Mount Athos. He reposed in 1994, died in 1994. So he's a relatively recent saint of the church, very beloved in the church. When I come and I venerate this, what I'll do is I, I may come and maybe I'll do a bow, I'll do the sign of the cross, and then I'll, I'll venerate, which means to kiss. And I'm showing honor and respect. So with the saints of the church, we believe that they can say with St. Paul, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And maybe even more importantly, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so we believe that this figure, St. Paisios, is standing at the throne of God right now. We believe that he's aware of us, and so when I venerate the, his icon, although I'm kissing wooden paint, the veneration, the honor and respect that I show the image is passed on to him. And he, in turn, recognizes that and prays for us. Just as I would ask you, know, you to pray for me, or, or you might ask me to pray for you, we ask those who are, uh, are standing at the throne of God and constantly interceding for the world to pray specific, specifically for us. Would you hold to the position that there's something more effective about his prayer than, like, say, I don't know, me? Well, St. James does tell us that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. And so, so what that tells us is that... a more righteous man availeth <laughs> more much? It, 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 it seems to indicate that not all prayer is necessarily equal. Hmm. Not all prayer is exactly the same. Hmm. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that, I, that I, I wouldn't want you to pray for me. You know, of, of course not. Um, I don't know your heart. God knows your heart. But with the saints, these are figures that the church has officially said, yes, this is a person whose life is worthy of emulation, who lived a life of righteousness and holiness, and indeed whom Christ actually dwelt within. Is it possible for the church to miss on a saint? Not, not, no, not in this case, no. Um, we believe that the, the church is led by the Holy Spirit with Christ as the head in, in the case of the, what we would call the glorification or is often called the canonization of saints. This is not something that we would miss on. It's usually also why the church is very practical about this. It usually takes about 50 years before okay. the church will officially glorify a saint. But in the case of St. Paisios, during his own lifetime, everybody knew. There's no question about this guy. Mm -hmm. There's no question. He's, he's somebody you can go to and he'll know your name and all your problems before you open your mouth. Just being around him, they could sense this is a man of prayer. I mean, countless miracles. He, he's an incredible figure. And so it didn't take very long with him. Are there things the church can miss on? Like I, I feel like I've got something of an understanding that's starting to develop of the, the Western Catholic notion of papal infallibility, which I think is often overstated by mm -hmm. outsiders, and the fallibility of the church or lack thereof, 
can the church make a mistake and in what areas is that possible? Yeah, yeah, to say can the church make a mistake is a really loaded question because when we talk about the church, we're talking about just like Christ was divine and human, the church is divine and human. The divine part can't make a mistake, but the human part, the human part is there to be made pure, made whole really, to be healed by the divine part. And this is, this is one of the primary images that we see given of the church in orthodoxy. The church is a hospital for the sickness of sin. So what do you expect to find in a hospital? Sick people. Yeah. And see, sick people are going to mess up a lot. And we see that throughout the history of the church. And so we see councils that were called ecumenical that were later declared to be false councils. We see obviously church leaders and ladies doing insane things that were ridiculous, sinful, heretical, all over the place. But we believe that in the end, the divine part will uphold and protect and guide the church and eventually it'll always prevail. The true part will always prevail. And sometimes that takes a while to kind of flesh out. Okay. Who are we looking at here? This is St. John of San Francisco. We have a couple icons of him in the church. We have this one here and then on what we call the iconostasis, he's sees the figure on the far right. Um, St. John reposed in 1966. His relics, his whole body, uh, continues to lie in state in, in the uh, Russian cathedral in San Francisco to this day where people go and ask his intercessions. Is there meaning to the arrangement of the various icons? Is there, pecking order sounds harsh, but now I've already said it. Is, right. there, is there a ranking system among the saints or some more revered than others? Oh, th there certainly are some that are more revered than others. That are, some are just universally known. For instance, St. Nicholas. Um, is, is universally known and when his feast day comes up in December. Is he in here somewhere? Uh, we do actually have an icon of him back here. Okay. I mean, I, that's one I've heard of, so you know, I get all excited. Yeah, St. Nicholas of Myra and Lycia, also known as St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker. We have, we have his icon here, and there's not an Orthodox Christian alive who's been Orthodox for more than a couple months who doesn't know his name okay. and know a little bit about his life. We also have the, the icon of our church here, Saints Peter and Paul. Okay. However, there's really no rule for this. In the narthex, if we had the room, we'd have an icon of Christ and the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos. But once you get inside of the church, really there's no definitive order. Many Orthodox churches don't have these, especially if you have pews, you don't have, you don't have room for them. Sure. So what the church will do is, when they can, they'll just put the, the figures that are, are really beloved in that particular community. And in this case, we have Saints Peter and Paul, the church's, the, the church's uh, patrons, Saint Nicholas, and then we have different figures that are just really beloved by this community. I think it was a classy move not to have this one sponsored by Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he looks a little There's different. There's a little than more dignity yeah, here yeah, to yeah, this yeah. one. Slightly. Um, Saints Peter and Paul, I noticed this outside and I meant to ask you there as well. They're doing this brotherly kiss and embrace. Right. Is this a very old icon or is this something that needed to be expressed later as an attempt to bridge the gap between West and East? No, from, from very early on, from very early on, you see these icons of Saints Peter and Paul embracing. And that's because, of course, the, the little spat that they had, the disagreement that mm -hmm. St. Paul describes in uh, Galatians, I think. In the Bible. In the Bible. And yes, yes, in that one, mm -hmm. in the New Testament. <laughs> and and uh, so it shows them embracing. But beyond that, there's also this really neat icon of the church as an ark. And it shows, it shows uh, Christ, uh, Christ on it with all the apostles. And it shows Saints Peter and Paul. I believe they're, they're the rudder. They're, they're holding the church. Mm -hmm. And the, the image, of course, is that if Peter is the, the apostle to the, primarily to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles, this shows the, the unity and the wholeness of the church in this icon. So as we move forward into the service. I lied, they're the anchor. You are being looked at. Oh, the anchor, not They're the, the anchor, rudder. yeah. Okay. I think well, Christ is the rudder. <laughs> what does it mean having them be the anchor? Uh, the, 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 I mean, this is it. The, the whole entire preaching of the church is based on, on the teachings of the, the apostles. And Saints Peter and Paul represent the entirety of the, of the apostolic lineage. Is that why we see that anchor image around in churches sometimes? Yeah, I'm guessing so. I'm okay. guessing so. Okay. So I walk in here, and there's nobody else in the room except us and my friends here. But it still feels like there's a lot of people in the room. I yes. mean, these, <laughs> these icons are relatively life-sized. Mm -hmm. It feels like you have company. Is that intentional? Yeah, it's that, that line in Hebrew is uh, to be surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, which is kind of the, the common sense that people want when they walk into the nave of the church. Our, our hope, actually, is that this area that's just blue right now will eventually be covered, uh, likely with um, major feasts of the Lord, um, transfiguration, crucifixion, or maybe even of some of his parables, which is a, a common thing. Again, as I described that icons are kind of the painted word of God, when people were illiterate, this was one of the ways that they would memorize scriptural stories, is by looking at the iconography. 
So baptismal, I assume, just based on the fact that there's a faucet here? That's right. Yep, we have two fonts here. We have okay. the infant font, which is that one right there. I could fit in there. You could. You wouldn't want to. Okay, fair enough. And then we have the adult one, which a little bit heavier, but we can do it. And there's the adult one with steps going down. Yeah, that's big. So these don't look like they're for dipping or sprinkling. These look like they're for dunking. Right, yeah. Baptizo literally means immerse. And so the ideal in the Orthodox Church is always triple immersion. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also triple because Christ was in the tomb for three days. So when you baptize a kid, because so I'm assuming this is for babies too? Yep, not just yeah, for like Any, a, anything yeah, for 40 days and old and older, we can, we can baptize a child. Wait, how many days and older? Usually 40 days. 40 days is when okay. they're brought back into the church, just like Christ was brought into the temple. Um, but if there's an emergency, we can do it even sooner. I have seen some videos on the internet of what looks like just insanely vigorous Orthodox baptizing. <laughs> yeah. Is that an exaggeration or you really get after it like I see that? We want to immerse them. And so some priests do that by going really quickly. Some priests do it by holding the baby upside down and covering their mouth. I mean, there's a lot of different ways, but we've been doing it for 2,000 years. I've baptized all four of my kids and uh, they all came out okay. I mean, relatively. <laughs> so, the, so the vigorous dunk then is about not having the kid under the water any longer than needed, but you want to fully immerse right. them? Right, right. Now, I've, I've seen priests do this just at a steady pace. The problem, it really isn't with the baby because you know, if you do this quick enough, but not too quick, the baby's fine. It's really with the, with the parents who kind of freak out about it. So some priests just choose to do it really, really fast. Is there any kind of Achilles element to this? I mean, I mean, it is a Greek version of church where like if you're covering the baby, does the water get between the hand and the baby right I don't there? think we count? think too much about that. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, you think hard about yeah. everything else. So, okay, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah, it's God who baptizes. I mean, this is, we're asking God to, to, to you know, bestow the grace of baptism upon this child, and I'm pretty sure he's not looking at it with his, with his uh, checkmark box and saying, oh, okay. uh-oh. <laughs> so for the big one, though, mm -hmm. I assume this is for someone who converts to orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. So if I converted to orthodoxy, I mean, my dad baptized me in the Baptist right. church when I was a kid. Right. Would I do this again, or is it one baptism and, and as with so many answers, it depends. <laughs> what does it, it depend depends. It really depends on the jurisdiction you're in, which means that are you in a Greek Orthodox church or a Russian or a okay. Romanian, in this case, Antiochian. Um, in, in our case, in this parish, we baptize everybody. And the reason for that isn't because we reject everything that came before you. In fact, we really emphasize that people cannot come in with a bitterness towards their previous confession. What you should do is be really thankful to God for the things that were good that came out of it and that led you to Orthodoxy and the beautiful things about it. Those are all good things. And we don't deny that. However, the Orthodox baptismal service is very, very full, and there's a lot going on in it that most people don't get otherwise. And so in order to receive the fullness of everything, we like to make sure everyone gets baptized. Um, I've had a lot of people who have been brought in just through chrismation, which after, after baptism in the New Testament, the apostles had the laying out of hands that became chrismation, this anointed with an oil. Um, and they would look back and regret it that they weren't baptized in the Orthodox Church. I have yet to have somebody who is baptized who looks back and says, I wish that I hadn't done that. What would the deprivation be? What would you be missing out if you got baptized in a setting like I did, became Orthodox, and then did not get baptized again? Yeah, if I, if I ran through the entire service, um, I can just go, uh, do some highlight points. We start in the back of the church because this is an entry into the church where we do exorcism prayers. Um, we do exorcism prayers on, on everybody. It's not that someone is, is demon-possessed, but rather that if we're going to fill you with grace, first we want to make sure that you're completely emptied, and this is just kind of the tradition of the church. Um, there are um, various prayers that are done here at the font and with the people. You're anointed with an oil, in, in commemoration of the, the, um, the olive branch that was brought back to Noah on the ark. And the ark is this, this symbol of baptism. The waters drown out all sin and salvation is found within the ark. And so there's an anointing with oil, which is also a, a commemoration of like, like how bodies were anointed before they were buried, because this again is a burial with Christ. Um, uh, and then there, there's a whole host of, of prayers and other things that happen along with it. Okay. And so again, just to make sure that somebody receives the fullness of it, we like to baptize absolutely everybody. The other issue is that um, a lot of people don't know how they were baptized. They were baptized as infants. They don't know, was it with immersion? Was it with sprinkling? Was it with, you know, at one point in history, I think um, I read that, that uh, some denominations uh, would just simply, uh, the, the pastor or priest would lick his thumb, put it in salt, and make the sign of the cross on their forehead. You know, is, is that really baptism? And so just to, to cover all the bases, we like to do everything. Oh, can I ask you a question about the exorcism part? Yeah, that, absolutely. You brought that up, and I didn't see that one coming. I guess it all comes down to soteriology. Like, when does somebody become a Christian? Because, and maybe I'm taking too many 
theological cues from Time Cop here, but I think of like the, you know, the, the two bits of the same matter can't occupy the same space at the same time. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I, can you have a demon in someone who is already a Christian? Can there be a thing that needs to be cast out or does the presence of Christ, of the Holy Spirit accomplish that? But I guess it comes down to, are they a Christian already when they're back there and they have signed up to do this? Or do they become a Christian when they get dipped? That's a convoluted question. Yeah, I, and, well, and I think the, the issue is that we run into this, this barrier when we talk about becoming a Christian to becoming a member of the church. Baptism is the entry into the church. Okay. But if someone were a catechumen, one who has dedicated themselves to being baptized, okay. but they didn't make it at that point, let's say they you know, horrifically, God forbid, got in a car accident, they would still receive a full Orthodox funeral as if they had been baptized because they had dedicated themselves at that point. And so when, now outside of the context of the Orthodox Church, what if someone's never heard of Orthodoxy, but they read the New Testament, they love Christ, they want to follow after him, when do they become a Christian? That's really between them and God. And that's okay. not something that I'm going to make a judgment on. And I, so you know, for you, it's not when they go a bit of the sign-up sheet in the back and they're like, yeah, I'd like to become a catechumen. No, I wouldn't. No, it, I wouldn't it's wouldn't an ambiguous. That. I think it is ambiguous so it's because not that, it's really about the state of the heart. confrontation, conversion point. Yeah. Like you see a more Baptistic I Christians. know plenty of people who have gone through the process and yet their Christianity is all about them. Hmm. And it just feeds egoism over and over and over again. Have they really inwardly converted? I don't know. This is, again, this is for God to decide their heart. Uh, St. Gregory, uh, the theologian of Nazianz, he says something along the lines of, there are some outside of the church who are, who are um, uh, more Christian than some of those who are inside of the church. And I think we've all seen people like this, like church leaders, where we go, mm, what's, what's really happening here? And okay. we see people who have never even heard of Christ who seem to have that, that Christ-like disposition towards service and humility. So where do people fall in this line? That's really for God. That's, that's okay. for God to decide. It's not really for me to decide. All I know is that he did give us a process. This process has been going on for 2,000 years, and so we want to continue with that process. If we know it's there, if somebody's ready for it, we're, we're going to do it as best we can. Can I ask you a question about another water-based item? Sure. What is this device over here? This is where we keep holy water. And so every, uh, every Feast of the Theophany in January, or Epiphany, the Baptism of Christ, we do a service, every Orthodox Church does this service, called the Great Blessings of the Water. Okay. And uh, in the Great Blessing of the Waters, um, there are various prayers that go along with blessing large amounts of water, and then we store a whole bunch in the back, and then we refill this uh, every week. So um, after liturgy, people can come, and they can receive some holy water if they want, and drink some, or... Uh, they'll also keep holy water at their house. And so they can come bring their, their vessels for it and refill them from here. Other than the obvious application of holy water, which is putting in little jars and fighting through Castlevania with it, <laughs> what does holy water actually My wife do? is from Transylvania. <laughs> oh, <that's right>. Okay, <laughs> that reference is not lost on you. What does holy water actually do? Yeah, it's, it, 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 there's this, this sense of whenever we, we bless an object, what are we doing? We're simply offering to God what he has already offered to us. But through sin and corruption, everything gets corrupted here. And so when we offer it back to God, there's, there's now grace associated with it. And now, like we were talking about the icons, it's not just what it, it does something. It does something. And so it's so kind of an interesting um, thing. And I, I don't know how to, how to, I don't know, say this in scientific terms, but one of the um, relatively modern saints of the church, St. Luke of Crimea, was a surgeon. And uh, after years of, of experience, he was well known too. He was, he was well known for being a, a, very, uh, a very good physician and a good surgeon. And he was known throughout the medical field, but he was also an Orthodox bishop. And of course, during communism, this created some problems. You can't just get rid of the guy who's well known in medical circles. And he has a quote where at the end of his life, he says that he's convinced, he's convinced that of all the medical things you could do for your health, of everything that you could do, nothing has greater benefit than drinking a little holy water every day. And he says, I say this not as a bishop of the church, but as a physician. I've seen that this has more benefit for people. What? So what does this mean? Again, I'm not, I'm not gonna sit there and try to understand it and qualify it. This is more about experience. <laughs> people who, who, re, who have a little holy water every day, some somehow have this experience. And uh, we see miracles associated with holy water all the time in the church. You know what I'm gonna say? I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I, I, I appreciate the perspective. I, I wonder if they said the same thing when Christ was baptized, <laughs> when Christ resurrected. I, mean, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so right next to this, in a room full of not furniture, mm -hmm. this really stands out. It's elaborate and ornate and awesome looking. And, and it's not mine. And I don't get it. <laughs> what does it do? What is this here for? Yeah, so the, when the bishop comes to visit, uh, he'll do some of the service from the altar, but also some of the service he'll do from out among the people. And this is actually the bishop's throne. Typically, you'll have an icon of Christ. Yeah, it's called the bishop's throne. Wow. Yep. 
Typically, you'll have that icon of Christ either on it or above it. In this case, we don't have that because we already had iconography on the wall and it wasn't built into the throne, but it's, it's Christ actually dressed as a bishop to show that there's really one true high bishop of the church, and that's, that's Christ, the one true high bishop and priest of the church. And, and he simply uh, uh, um, expounded upon his ministry, essentially. It's Christ's ministry through him, as it is with the priest. Um, so this is, this is where uh, the bishop uh, begins most of the services. Like right here, you don't drag the chair out into nope. the middle. Nope, it's right here. Interesting position. Okay. I got one more question over here on furniture, if that's yeah. all right. What does this booth or stand do? Yeah, so all of our, our services are basically chanted through. Um, there's very, very little that is read. And so things will be intoned. Intoned is just simply you keep one note. And you drone when you talk. Um, other things are, are chanted in Byzantine chant. Do you know any of them off the top of your head? Um, yeah, I could. I mean, I could chant. Um, uh, for instance, we were talking about Theophany. When thou, O Lord, was baptized in the Jordan, worship of the Trinity was made manifest. For the voice of the Father bore witness to thee, calling thee his beloved Son. And the Spirit in the likeness of a dove confirmed the truth of his word. O Christ our God, who has appeared and enlightened the world, glory to thee. I could have chosen something shorter, but okay. that's... <laughs> okay, that was a mountain of theology. Yes. And also pretty good. The, 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 <laughs> my sister never thinks so. She oh, hates think, when people come on my I, I it, I'm impressed. The, uh, the, theology, uh, the theology of the church will be found in, in these, the, the, the books that contain the services and the hymns of the church. And we have a lot of these. In fact, behind this is just shelves of books. Can I look at books. this? Absolutely. The great Horologion, the Horologion. book of hours, which has the, the service of hours, but a bunch of other services. And you'll notice it has for every month and day, it has different services. Well, let's go to now. So, is this, is all of this sung? Yes, uh, yeah, basically. Again, every now and then something will be read. For instance, when we get to what's called the Synexodion, the Lives of the Saints, the chanters will read this. But for the most part, everything we do is, is uh, either intoned or chanted, including even the Gospels. When, we, when the priest reads the Gospel lesson for the day, he'll intone it. So what does it mean when it says fourth tone, third tone, first tone? So Byzantine chant uh, has come to have uh, eight different keys or tones. Um, each tone is, is kind of like a, like a Western key that it's chanted in. And so each hymn will have a particular tone that it's done in. And sometimes there's a model hymn that it'll be modeled after. Do people know this? It, it just takes, it takes a lot, no. Uh, what, they'll, what they'll know are the, the hymns that, and the, uh, the typical chant that they hear every single week at liturgy. You hear things enough time, you start to get it. But, but as for the, like, the deep tones and stuff, this takes a lot of study. And uh, chanters spend a lot of time kind of learning these things. So nobody would walk up here, there would never be a moment in the service where it would be like, shunning all earthly and corruptible pleasures, you choose a life of great, I mean, you wouldn't no. do that. No, we have, we have something called that. the minor order, orders of the church. And one of those is, is to, be, to be tonsured a reader. And so this is somebody who has, has uh, done their work and has learned the chanting of the services and, and know, knows the services pretty well and can put them together from all the different books. And they actually have a position. And so we, we have a couple readers in the church who, who are the main chanters. You said tonsured. Do tonsured. they cut their hair? There, yeah, this? there is. There is it, Not only that, but actually when we were talking about baptism, after someone is baptized, we also tonsure them. Um, with but, you, but not like the, the rookie year Tim Tebow Tiny bit haircut. of hair, tiny bit of hair, with, with the idea that what do we have to offer God but our very selves? So, I mean, he, get, okay. he gave us everything that we have, and so all we can do is offer ourselves back to God. Okay. Do you ever do a responsive reading, like a Protestant would do, where somebody reads or sings part of it, and then somebody echoes that back? We do, actually, the chanters do that yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, there's a, there's a thing where there's a, um, a chanting kind of back and forth. In fact, in some churches, what you'll see is this will be a little bit further up, closer to the solea, and then you'll have another one on the other side. And th th there will be chanters on both sides, and one will chant one thing, and then the other will have a response and kind of back and forth. We call it dueling chanters. Okay. And if you get prima donnas, it makes it either really fun or really horrible. <laughs> okay. But thank God we don't have that. <laughs> so is this all memorized for the congregation or do you have a little handout or a bullet? No, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, you know, out of this, for one, one days of service, you're going to do very little of this. Most of the services that are, I mean, now we do everything in English, which makes it easier on people. But most of the services that people go to are services that are done like the Divine Liturgy. 
very little of the liturgy changes from day to day. Only a few hymns change. Everything else is basically the same. And so if you come enough, you start to memorize these things. I mean, my, my three-year-old daughter will walk around the house chanting some of the hymns that she hears in church every single week just because they're ingrained in her. Would there ever be instrumentation? No. Um, now, this is, again, this is kind of goes back to the whole pew versus no pew debate. In, in America, many churches have now uh, brought p uh, uh, organs into the church. But there's debate over whether that's appropriate or not. We always want to make sure that the, first of all, there's no greater instrument that God gave us than our very voices uh, for most people, <laughs> not necessarily for everybody. But we also want to make sure we stay away from anything that starts to lend our worship towards entertainment. And so we're very, very cautious, not, not, because entertainment becomes about filling us and making us feel good. And this is about emptying ourselves. And beyond that, we also want to make sure that what's emphasized in the chanting are the words. Because as you said, the words are absolutely full of theology. If you want to know the theology of the church, grab some of the books from the Chanter Standard Orthodox Church and read those. You'll learn everything you need to know about theology. When you do church, are you up there the whole time or are you out here at all? I'm up there 95% of the time. Every now and then, uh, I or one of the deacons will come and will sense the entire church. So, oh, yeah, uh, we'll take, Father James told me about this at the Coptic yep, Church. Yep. It's the, the big sensor with the bells and, okay. and you know, it will swing that up and down um, and sense everybody and all the icons. Um, and there are a few things that uh, other services that will actually take place out here, like baptisms and weddings and things will take place mostly in the nave, but for the most part, I'm in the altar. At the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church that I visited, I noticed that the priest had his back to the congregation almost the whole time. Do mm -hmm. you do it the same way? We do. We do. This is, this is not supposed to be um, something that I'm performing for the people, but rather doing on behalf of the people. That's emblematic of a little bit more of a sense of you being in a go-between role in your priestly role here as opposed to the pastoral role in a Protestant church where there isn't as much of that sense of, of I do anything as the go-between, rather we're kind of all in this together. Yeah, I would say that we, all, we certainly are all in this together. I, for instance, I can't come and do the liturgy alone. I need at least one other person here to say the amen. We do this as a whole. Really? However... One other person is a quorum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the worship sense, yes. <laughs> I need at least one other person here. However, there are those who are set apart, just as the apostles and deacons in the New Testament are set apart. Priests are set apart specifically to lead the services. I keep pointing at stuff as I ask questions. Is it rude for me to point at an Completely. icon? Completely. No, 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 not at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're fine. Okay. I see you've got Mary and Christ as the icons that are at the very front. Mm -hmm. I think this would be the highlight, right? Right. So when people walk in, whenever they walk in, even if the service has already started, uh, they'll come and they'll venerate all the icons that we've already seen, and then they'll come up and venerate Christ and the Virgin Mary, who we call the Theotokos, the birth giver of God. They kiss these? They'll, yep, they'll kiss those as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then you put little short ones in here for people like me? Yeah, that's right. So I can feel <laughs> like I got to go to yep. church too? For you and children who can't quite reach this one, okay. they can venerate those. So then I look up here, and you call this the iconostasis, mm -hmm. is that correct? Mm -hmm. What is that? I think I can break that down. It, it literally listening. means icon stand, so it's kind of an interesting thing, but in the very, very early church, these icons were re really just on a, a rail or a stand, and then this slowly developed over time as Christianity was legalized. Is it the same layout in all Greek Orthodox churches, or is there something unique about this? There are differences based on the church that you're in. So, uh, this icon will always be one of Christ. In this case, it's Christ the teacher, which is, is uh, pretty typical. And then over here, we'll have the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, holding the Christ child. Always okay. the same. Those are basically always the same. The icon one over will be typically the icon of the church. In this case, we're Saints Peter and Paul, and so we have Saints Peter and Paul here together. Okay. These are actually doors. So we have the Archangel Michael on the left oh, side. Hey. And the Archangel sneaky. Gabriel. Okay. And so these are what are known as the deacon's doors. The priest will usually go in and out of the center. The deacons will come out of the side doors. Um, okay. All of the priests will do that as well at times. Wait, what's a deacon in Orthodoxy? A, a deacon is just as, as he was in the, uh, in the New Testament. He's, he's there to, to assist the priests in the ministries. And so he has a certain liturgical function, um, but he also does a, 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 lot of the, uh, a lot of the work in the church. Now, in our case, we have two deacons who have secular jobs, so they don't, they don't, uh, they don't have full-time positions in the church, although that does exist. Um, it's just our particular parish. But One of those first deacons was from Antioch, wasn't he? Nicholas of Antioch was listed in that initial list of That's it. folks who do that job. Mm -hmm. Look at that. It all fits together, <laughs> sort of. It just keeps going. Yeah. Uh, okay. fr from then on, 
really there's no, there's no universal tradition for what you do with the icons going down. And so in this case, again, it's icons of figures who are especially important to people in the church. We have a lot of Russians, and so we have St. Vladimir, who is known as the baptizer of the Rus. <laughs> he okay. baptized the Slavic lands. And then we have St. Xenia of St. Petersburg, who's very, very much beloved in our church. And in fact, we've built a, a second church an hour uh, south of here, and it's named after her. To the right side, I, I kind of cut us off. We, we've got, obviously, Jesus in position one. Right. I could have told you that was John the Baptist, even without the name on there, because right. of the outfit. And that's a typical one in every Orthodox church as well. Okay. And then we had we have archangels on both of these doors. Is this another deacon story? You call that's it? right. Yep. That's the deacon's door. That's with the archangel Gabriel. And who do we have on the end? And then, as we go down here, we have uh, St. Catherine, the great martyr. He's an incredible, incredible saint of the church. And that's not Catherine the Great. That's St. Nope. Catherine, Catherine the, the Great, great Martyr. martyr. <laughs> the great, okay. great Martyr, right, right, a different Catherine. And then we're back to St. John of San Francisco. All right, so we've got the iconostasis to recognize the gospel authors here below. What happens behind the curtain? Well, what I'll do is I'll open it up, and if it's okay, I'll head into the altar, and you can kind of just see from here and just peek sure. over the doors. I'll open it from here. And there's the altar. You know, the word, the word altar, sometimes people mean the altar table. In this case, we mean the entire area, but this is the altar table. I'll just open these up. On the altar, you always have three things. I mentioned before how there's kind of parallels between the Jewish temple and the Orthodox church. I like to tell people that Orthodox worship always looks backwards and forwards. Backwards because it grew out of the Jewish temple worship and forwards because it should be a shadow of heavenly worship. And so inside of the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant, you had three things, right? You had the the uh, tablets of the Ten Commandments, you had the manna that fell from heaven, and then you had Aaron's rod that budded. Sure. Okay, and so on every Orthodox altar, we have kind of fulfillment of those three things. The tablet of the Ten Commandments, underneath this is the Book of Gospels. Aaron's rod that budded, it's through the cross that salvation sprouted forth or budded forth for all salvation. And so we always have a blessing cross. And then the mana that fell from heaven, you know, what is it that sustains man? We believe that was an image of Holy Communion. And so we always have a reserve sacrament in this, what's called the tabernacle. What is a reserve sacrament? So it's, uh, it's consecrated. So it's the uh, bread and wine that has been consecrated in the body and blood of Christ. And so when somebody is, is sick in the hospital or you know, home, home or you know, wherever they can't come to church, I can take the pieces of communion with me in my hospital bag and take it to them and they can receive communion. So can you consecrate new bread without somebody present? Or is that someone needs to be here to say amen thing? Does it apply That's to That's always done within the context of the liturgy. Always okay. done. So what, what we'll do is we'll take, we'll take an extra portion of the bread and consecrate rather than just one host. We'll consecrate two and we'll let the other one uh, dry out because we actually dip it in, in the wine, the blood. We let it dry out and then cut it into little pieces and put it back there. And I actually have one of the, one of the breads if you want to see yeah. what we use. Absolutely. So in the Orthodox Church, we use leavened loaves of bread rather than unleavened. So we have yeast in it and, and that rising is a representation of the resurrection. And the Orthodox Church will have this seal on it. Wait a second. So you're flipping that leaven metaphor from what at times in the Bible is associated with sin. It can be a negative thing. Sin, <laughs> Beware the leaven Jesus of the Pharisees. Jesus flips it in, what is it, Matthew 13, with the kingdom parable about, right. I mean, at one point, a little yeast working through the whole dough is like right. sin messing with your church. Right. At another time, it's, it's a notion of how the kingdom right. grows and expands. So you latch on to that kingdom idea of it. Yeah, I mean, certainly we'll, you know, you use both in preaching, but in this case, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll use it specifically for the spread, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, this is what a typical seal will look like. Different, uh, different uh, uh, churches will have slightly different versions of this, but this is okay. typically what we use. In the middle, you have ICXC, which is the first and last letters of the name Jesus Christ in Greek. And you'll see it, if you look up in this icon of the Virgin Mary, the one we talked about before, more, more oh, spacious yeah. than the heavens, you see in blue above Christ's shoulders, ICXC. So most, most of the cases of Christ, an icon has this ICXC. Okay. And then below you have NIKA. And believe it or not, you, you're, you're familiar with this because there's a certain sporting company that has used this as their name, Nike. Victory. And the reason is, is because it means victorious or triumphant. So Jesus Christ, victorious or triumphant. And this square is actually what's cut, cut out and consecrated as the body of Christ. Okay? There's a little triangle here, which is to commemorate the Virgin Mary. And then we have nine little triangles to commemorate various ranks of angels and saints. Then, let me grab the patent. I'll show you what that looks like. So this, this is the patent. 
And after we cut out the, the lamb, the body, it'll be placed here, the piece of the Virgin Mary here, the nine ranks of angels and saints here. And then we commemorate both living members of the church and departed. And so by the time we start liturgy, this will be prepared. And this is a representation of the entire church. You have you Christ. Patent? Uh, we call it a patent. Yeah. P-A-T-E-N. P -A -T -E -N. E -N. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then at the appropriate time of the liturgy, right before Holy Communion, that body, that piece that says ICXC will be placed inside of a chalice. And the chalice will have now the consecrated wine or the blood, and it'll actually be placed inside of the chalice and dropped in there and left in there. And as people come and receive communion, little pieces will be cut off and they'll receive communion one by one, like this down at the bottom of the steps. How is it consecrated? Uh, there are, at the kind of the height of the liturgy is what we call the great anaphora. This is a long series of prayers. Um, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom has the typical one. St. Basil has a much longer one, which is really beautiful. It goes through the whole history of salvation. Um, then we have the words of institution. Uh, um, this is my body, take eat, you know, take drink, this is my blood. And then there's a prayer that, that calls down the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the differences between Orthodoxy and Catholicism. We always have a prayer that, that asks the Holy Spirit to come and to sanctify these gifts. And the priest will take the paten with the body on it and bless over it. And then he'll do the same with the chalice. There's, of course, prayers that go along with each of these. And then over both together. And that's, that's the official consecration of the gifts. Okay. So people hear that. They, they there's, a, there's chanting this. that goes on over it. Um, different churches will do it different ways. In some, in some cases, um, the churches like it that the priest says it very loud. So the people say the amen after each and every item is consecrated or each item is consecrated. Um, in other cases, the deacon will say the amen and the people are chanting something quietly, but we'll say it loud enough that they can hear it. Do people understand what's going on? Do they, Hopefully. I mean, does your average person <laughs> get all the things that are occurring with your back to the room? Yeah, the, the hope is that people have been well catechized, but of course there's so much to learn in the church. I mean, I, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And I, I'm constantly reading and constantly learning more. And so hopefully you've not only been catechized well and taught before you became a member of the church, but even while you become a member, this is what homilies are for. This is what the extended teachings are for. We do okay. a lot of teachings outside of the liturgy and, and uh and uh, go through these types of things. Lives of saints, what's happened in the liturgy, history of the church, obviously scriptural, you know, Bible study classes, everything. Okay. So you have this icon of Christ crucified mm -hmm. above all of it, which it makes sense that that would be there given what we're doing. Mm -hmm. when, a, when a reformed minded Protestant type person sees that image, they're gonna go right to notions of the atonement, the idea of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and what happened there. How does the Orthodox Church understand what the atonement is, what happened with yeah. the cross? It's a massive question. It's a massive question that could, could uh, be wrapped up in, in about a four hour long discussion, but oh, I'll try to wrap it up as, 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 as quick as possible. There were three main issues that mankind had at the fall. He had his separation from his creator. The uncreated God and the created man were separated. Then of course, there's the problem of sin which is, which is a, 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 an inability to love God perfectly, maybe more so than just doing something bad, maybe more so than just committing a crime against God. Of course, that's part of it, but this inability to, to really love God perfectly and live, live in perfect union with him, and then, of course, death. And so it's the entire life of Christ. Of course, there's a great emphasis placed on the crucifixion and the resurrection. There's no doubt about that, but the entire life of Christ begins to heal this in his very incarnation, the divine and human are reunited in one person. In, in the cross, sin, sin is destroyed. He who is sinless destroys sin on the cross and the resurrection death is destroyed. And so it all comes together. The, the, the main issue that we have talking about this is that the Orthodox Church has never come up with one paradigm to try to describe the entirety of salvation and what salvation means because the mystery of it is too grand. It's too massive of a, of a thing to come up with one paradigm. However, we would say that if we look at all the paradigms that people have come up with, I'd say there's, there's truth in, in all of them, but there's also limitations in all of them. And so for us, we look at things more kind of in a, in a therapeutic sense. Sin is a disease, and Christ came to heal that disease. He, he came to, to, to grant man healing, and we do that through a life of faith. We were, we're, in the baptism, we, we die and resurrect with him, and then through a life of faith, we seek union with him so that when death looks at us, death sees he who has already destroyed him and flees and runs the other way.
lots of us, I suppose, might like to heal sin or, or redeem everything. What is unique about, or is there anything unique about this particular style of death and what happened to Jesus that stands out? Could he have died in another way and it would have accomplished the same thing? Is there, it, what is the place of the cross? In orthodoxy, I yeah, guess. it's it, it's uh, there, there's there's a lot that could be said about this, and and part of the reason this becomes complex is because of course God is outside of time, and so He knew He was going to die on the cross. So we have mm -hmm. all these images of the cross in the Old Testament. I mean, again and again and again, we see these images of the cross. We see you know Abraham having Isaac carry the wood on which he's going to be sacrificed up, the, you know, in order to be sacrificed on it. Um, when we have hymns about Moses part in the Red Sea, we don't say that he went like this. We say that he he took his staff and went like this, and then like this. You know, the mm -hmm. the the serpent. On, the, on his staff. I used to think of it kind of wrapped around the rod, but I, now I think of it more like this. You know, it's the, this constant images of the cross. The Passover uh, blood. Uh, of course, the Passover blood, and we can keep going. You know, the wood being thrown into the rancid water and making it pure. Hmm. Again and again, this image of, of, of the cross was, was prophesied again and again. And beyond that, you also have the idea that it's, it's through a tree that man fell. It's through eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and now it's through the tree of the cross that mankind is saved. saved. And so how does this all play out within the grand scheme of salvation? That's within God's purview and his providence, and he seemed to work this out so that there was a perfect story that we don't fully understand, okay. but the cross seemed to be the way that we knew Christ was going to die, or at least that, that, that once he did die, we, we could see it in the Old Testament. It was also, the, the, um, it was also a, a completely shameful death. And it shows the grand humility and the love that God has for his creation. Mm -hmm. So in Christ dying for us, again, he who was without sin, who had no need of death, out of just pure love, mercy, and grace for mankind, took this upon himself so that when we unite with him, he's already destroyed it. He's already shown that he has complete power over all of this. Mm -hmm. So whereas the Reformed type might look to the complexity of the Westminster Confession or the Westminster Catechism and be like, there, we're trying to, we think we can spell out every aspect of what exactly the Bible says about the cross, the atonement, what Jesus did there, what is happening in the spiritual realm. I'm hearing more of a, sure, that could all be, but there's a greater mystery to this than we can articulate. Is that a fair restatement of? Yeah, I'd say this is a mystery that we have to first experience and then understand. Hmm. And I think we spend too much time trying to understand it before we try to experience it. And in experience it, we okay. realize my mind can't fully comprehend this. I can't put this into a nice, neat little box. And it's interesting because the scriptures really don't try to do that. Now, of course, St. Paul does talk about the sacrifice. There's no question about that. But he doesn't go through a very systematic explanation of this is what this means, this is what this means, and, and that's all there is to it, and it fits in this nice box, and here, accept it. You have to read into it, which is why we have 2,000 years of, of people interpreting his writings. I mean, if it was that simple, we wouldn't have to spend too much time interpreting it. It would just be very clear. Sure. And so again, I think there's truth in a lot of these different theories of salvation. I just think, as you said, there's this limitation in trying to box it up and present it as this nice little gift you know, with a big bow on it and say, okay, this is salvation. For us, it's more of a sense of, this is so grand and there's so much that Christ did on the cross. There's one priest that said this, it was really beautiful. He said, he said, if you look at all the different names given for Christ in the scriptures, think of the New Testament, all the different names. And he came up with a list of like you know, 40 different names for Christ. And he said, think of how each one of these pertains to the mystery of salvation and then try to come up with one paradigm that covers all of them. There's no way. There's no way. One paradigm won't do it. One paradigm may get to more the heart of it. Like this, this, this explains pretty well more the, the essence of what happened. But there's a lot of other facets here that aren't completely covered. Last question. So what is it to be an Orthodox Christian? It means to, <laughs> it means to die daily. It means to live a life of, of repentance. Repentance that is, is, is deepening and lived every day. A living repentance. This is what it really means to be an Orthodox Christian. Um, I don't know how to explain it in any other words than that, but to take up your cross daily and to follow after Christ, to completely and, and wholly try to look at yourself and get rid of all these things that we, we, we spend way too much time, time trying to put on this image of ourselves, of who we think we are. But St. Isaac the Syrian, who we have on a wall back there somewhere, he has this very famous saying where he says, he who knows himself is greater than he who can raise the dead by his prayers. Because to know yourself, you can't know yourself apart from your creator. But we also can't know our creator until we stop obsessing over ourselves so much. And so what do we try to do? 
through repentance, daily lived repentance, we try to decrease ourselves enough that Christ comes and dwells inside of us and reveals the true self. Thank you. Appreciate it. I've got like 11 billion things running through my mind coming out of that tour. And I, I'm sure you do too. If you're Orthodox, you're probably like, well, well, a normal Tuesday night. For the rest of us, that is a lot to think about. Now, normally, this is the part of the video after the tour where we sit and we game it all out together. But I think that conversation merits its own video. So I'm going to sit myself back down at this desk. And the next video is going to be a game it out session between us about what we just saw. So that video is coming up, and then I also found another time to do a sit-down, deep-dive theology, church history interview with Father Paul. And so the next video will be one of those, like the next next video will be that interview. Thing number two, and I am so excited about this. Thank you for hanging out with me so I can tell you about it. This video is brought to you by Africa Renewal, and I guess in a way I'm sponsoring them too. This is the kind of thing that I don't normally do on this channel, but I'm so amped to get to do this time around because, well, I'm asking you for something that gives you a chance to make the world obviously better, regardless of where you're coming from, what you believe, how you vote, what you're into politically or socially or any of that stuff. There's a thing that is inarguably good and redemptive in this gigantic sea of things that you and I encounter right now every day that is difficult and troubling and that we can't do anything about. Here's a situation that we can do something about. Africa Renewal does work in Uganda where they find kids who are in need of sponsorship and then they connect those kids with people like you and me. So for 40 bucks a month, and yeah, I'm straight up gonna ask you to consider sponsoring a child. For 40 bucks a month, you can change a kid's life. Now, 40 bucks is nothing to sneeze at. I get that. I get that it's a sizable commitment. 40 bucks is a big deal to me and my family. But then I get to looking at the numbers here. You're talking about a country that has 60% unemployment in Uganda. The sponsored families, the kids from the sponsored families, the average income per day is like five bucks, literally five bucks household income for a day. And then you add to that that in Uganda, school is not free for a kid. Healthcare, you got to pay for. Food, well, the only kind of food you can afford on a household income of five bucks a day is not going to be the kind of food that a kid needs to thrive. And so our 40 bucks, which is a big deal, turns into a whole lot more purchasing power when you take it to Uganda. And that's what Africa Renewal does. Now, the deal right now is that they have got roughly a thousand kids without sponsors that they've been able to connect with. And as that backlog keeps growing, they got to a place where they're like, we just, we need some help getting people to sponsor kids and to cut into this backlog, get kids off the waiting list and into the actual make their lives better list. And so they came to me and asked if I would help. And my answer was, yeah, I will help. And I think we can help with that. So if you're looking for something that is just plain, flat, good, and redemptive to do with your money, if you've seen a bajillion things come down the pike that you feel frustrated and helpless to do anything about because they so obviously need fixing, but you can't fix it, here is something redemptive that you can do. My wife and I had that same mindset that I'm articulating right now, and we heard about this, and we jumped on it, and we decided to sponsor a little girl named Monica. And my heart was instantly soft for her, is soft for her. We got this card. This is not the one. This is a sample one. That's not her. We got this card that came after we signed up to sponsor her and has a picture of her and details about her life. And we even got to see some stuff that she wrote to us. It's like half words because she's just learning to write and half pictures of things. She doesn't know how to spell the words of yet. And so we got a sense of who she is and what her little brain, little heart are like at this point. And I'm just excited for all of the opportunities that are in front of her and to think that we get to help in some way to open those doors so that whatever she's going to become is, well, what she's going to become. And we kind of get this, uh, this helper role in the whole thing. And so we're pumped about that. I'd be grateful if you'd consider the same thing. AfricaRenewal.org slash TMBH is how you learn more about that. 
Seriously, thank you a ton for considering it. And thank you for being up for conversations like the one we just had, learning about other people's expression of faith as well. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.